You're listening to the Higher Ideas Podcast, where ideas grow. Connect on Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, or higherideas.net. Now here's your host, I. Hello, fellow human, and welcome back to Higher Ideas. I'd like to ask you a question today. Do you live a 9-to-5 life? Do you live the life where you wake up, go to work, do a job that doesn't mean too much to you, go home exhausted, sleep, wake up, go to work, and so on and so on. I think the vast majority of the population obviously does live this way. And it's very disheartening, it's very draining, and it's very bleak, isn't it? So, of course, it's kind of silly to ask you the question, do you ever feel that you're missing out? Do you ever feel that you're in the wrong place? Do you ever feel that... There's greater things you can accomplish with your life if you only had the guts to go and take a risk and not go for this easy plug into the system sort of here's some money if you just give us labor sort of paradigm. As I said, it's obvious most people would probably say, yes, I feel that way all the time. And I do too. I've been struggling with this question myself for months. Um, I've been enjoying a comfortable job with comfortable pay, not the most comfortable commute, but it's easy work, comfortable work, great co-workers, I've been exposed to many amazing people, it's been good in many ways, but there's always this gnawing feeling that it's taking me away from something I should be doing. For example, the podcast. I want to be able to work so much faster on this podcast, and it's been slow because I have so little time to work on it. Between a 9-to-5 schedule, all the other things you have to do, a long commute, feeling tired, by the time I get home, I don't have the energy to record my thoughts adequately. Um, So it has been handicapping this thing that I feel is my real work in life. This podcast and everything around it in my personal life is my real work in life right now. I'm very devoted to this project. So there's this conflict. And the strangest thing happens because I've been sort of stuck in this conflict. What do I do? What should I do? And I've been at a loss. Now the whole concept of this series, Hello Universe, is about looking for the universe sending you messages through other people. And the funniest thing happened around this situation. The universe phoned me. The universe sent me the answer to my problem in the form of Alex, a female co-worker of mine, who I had seen around the studio many times before. Some people had suggested I speak with her, but I never took the initiative. But there has been a seating rearrangement at work, and we happen to basically be placed in a situation to speak to each other. And so we did, and very quickly I found out that she was debating leaving as well, leaving the 9-to-5 life and taking a radical shift in her life. How synchronous is that? These magical sort of things happen when you really have your ears open to the mechanics of the universe, to hear the opportunities when they're there. And of course, I grabbed this opportunity, brought her on the podcast, and had this great conversation with her before she leaves. So please, if you are feeling the same struggle, have a listen to this conversation, and hopefully you'll get something out of it too. Universe Switchboard, how may I direct your call? Get me someone awesome. You got it, honey. Please hold. Uh, why don't you tell people a little bit about yourself? Well, uh, I'm originally from France, and uh, I've traveled and moved a lot, uh, both for my job and because I was looking for a place where I actually could think that I would belong there. Mm. Uh, I haven't quite found that, uh, even though I liked a lot of things about the places I've lived in. And so basically, yes, it's been that. It's been, I've considered like the way I've led life up until now as a journey that will bring me to a place where I want to be. But So you've been a person um, on a journey looking for something. Right? Yeah, I've been looking for multiple things actually. I've been looking for myself first, then I've been looking for a place that I could fit myself 
in. Right. That would feel that I could call home, uh, pretty much. And uh, I think uh, that's that's what I would say about it. Mm. It was like first taking ownership of my own identity, which I felt like I was kind of stripped off when I was younger. And then actually taking ownership of mm. like the place I would be living in and actually managed to get attached to a, a certain location and and also find a balance between that and work. So, uh, so I guess people listening already got a taste. Uh, I, I guess I should say uh, you're also an artist and we work together, right? That's okay to say. Right? Yeah, that's okay to say. Um, and I just recently started speaking with you and very quickly I got this kind of thing out of you and realized, <laughs> wow, this is a deep person. So obviously let's have you on the podcast. And the thing that I think clicked the most when we spoke uh, in the few short conversations we've had so far, uh, the thing that stuck out for me is we seem to be sharing a similar predicament in life, which is, what do I do with my life? I know I'm not content with where my life is right now, but wherever I want it to go takes a big sort of leap of faith. And I think you described that you're in the same position in your life right now, right? Yeah, I'm about to. I'm about to actually start shaking up things a little, and uh, I made decision to move again. I was a bit reluctant at first because I thought, oh, I've been doing that for so long. It's probably been the sixth time in probably like at the time of like seven years or so. But mm. uh, but I decided I would do it again, and I decided that this time it would be different. I would actually do something that scares me for once, like. Wow. Usually, I think when I've left places, it was, it was more because I started feeling that there was emptiness around and that I wouldn't find the fulfillment that I was looking for. So now it's more like, all right, so maybe I've done too much of the same thing and maybe I will now need to start looking at what, what it is that I haven't looked at or done when I moved. Hmm, something very different. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying, I've been focusing on work way too much, so now I'm trying to focus a little more on, like, personal life and uh, and maybe a bit belief also, like, what what kind of place do I feel like I should go to and explore and, uh, and mm. yeah, it's, it's a bit of that. It's a lot of things that drove the move, the fact that... Uh, doing a creative job is only satisfying till the point where you stop being able to be creative in your job. Right. And this is a problem we, we run into as corporate artists, right? Rather than someone on this, in the, uh, practically in the streets making a living off painting their soul and trying to make money. You know, it's a very different thing when you're corporate. It kind of numbs you out and you lose yourself a little, right? I think it's always been that. It's always been like, even when I was a student, I think I remember one of my art direction teacher teacher told me once, like, okay, so you, you're either going to be the, the artist that work for a big corporation and you're going to make big mm -hmm. money, but you're going to be giving your soul away mm -hmm. to the devil. That's basically. how it works. <laughs> Or you're going to be a starving artist. Yeah. And uh, other than that, he said there is really little room for like for a gap that is something that is more in between the two because it's much more of unstable situations like starting companies and stuff like that. You can have more freedom, but right. you have to have the guts to do it and also the means to make it successful. So uh, Right, and then when your company takes off and becomes a huge thing, then you're trapped again because you're the CEO of this big corporate company and the cage slowly comes in again. It's a very interesting... I actually, I actually thought that uh, maybe I would leave and do something totally different. Yeah, so uh, what do you think? Have you had any ideas uh, yet? I, it's been like, I think it was four years ago, I thought I would go to like some random country like India or something and I would go there and I would either I had, oh, wow. teach English or art to kids in hmm. schools. I actually thought about India too. <laughs> and uh, and uh, why I think it's because I mean uh, I feel like maybe I've lived a selfish life while moving and stuff like that and maybe it's actually not within my own uh, area of expertise and comfort that I will find what I'm looking for. So mm. 
it's kind of like maybe the polar opposite and it's too much and maybe I won't go as far as that but uh, it's it's thoughts like that that cross my mind and I'm like yeah that would be a real change and and I'm I'm actually wondering what could come out of it like maybe it's gonna be like oh my god why why have I been working like that for so long yeah. when when such things were at reach exactly. and offered much more enrichment than, mm -hmm. than a desk job on a daily basis. Yeah, this is true. I mean, a lot of people growing up in our society, you know, they go get a nine to five job or even a bad job, like say McDonald's or some, just some random just job because they feel that's the only way to live is to go out, get a job, make money and a lot of people don't seem to even think about leaving, which is strange. I mean, it is scary to leave to a new place or to go have a completely out-of-the-box life, but it seems to be where the rewards lie, at least for the soul, in a big way. It's, it's funny because I come from a family where everyone is living in the same village. Mm. I mean, uh, and I know some other artists here are... Uh, I won't give away names, but right. I know they came from sometimes ranch and... Mm. People were people that were destined to be like breeding horses and uh, and picking up grass and uh, and uh, why did they why did they come here in Toronto and started working in like something that was that had something to do with digital media? It's because they were they wanted to get away and see what was out there. Right. To me, it was more of a, like it was more of like a, I needed to go away. It was my survival skills that kicked in, mm. and uh, I was like, okay, so I can't stay here anymore. I need to leave. And uh, I'm a bit of a person that has the two polar opposites. So I was like, if I need to leave, and I'm not picking the next neighborhood available, right? So. You're going to go at the extreme. If you do first, something, it's going to be big, yeah, right? Yeah, my yeah. first move was to Sweden. Huh. Uh, so uh, I was already moving from France to another country, mm -hmm. uh, to a country that spoke a different language, that had a very different culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then from that, I started going from place to place. Uh, China was, was probably the most... Uh, life-changing experience of them all because mm. uh, so yeah the thing with China was that I I thought people I thought the, in the way people were behaving or in the way they were treating other people or in their habits it showed that we didn't think the same way it showed that they didn't approach interaction the same way mm. it showed that they didn't have the same thoughts about even random buildings or objects the same way. Mm -hmm. And it felt really like I had this lost in translation experience that mm. is like, that is very well pictured in the movie, by the way, where I know we would hang out with like foreigners because we would feel like we should be friends because it was a totally strange experience. So sort of uh, foreigners holding on to each other for dear life, like a life raft in the ocean, right? It wasn't really that bad, but uh, it was like feeling safe. It was like, it was like bringing a piece of, of something that was known in everything that was unknown. Hmm. It was kind of like you bring a light in a dark area. Right. Not to say that the culture was necessarily dark because there was nothing bad. It was really mesmerizing. There is always action going on everywhere. There it's different. You, you can hang out in the streets four in the morning. There's always people populating areas, mm -hmm. offering new stuff. But uh, you forget about all you know because you know nothing there. You don't know the language. You can't read signs in the streets. You can't order at a restaurant. You can't, you can't give direction to a cab without having people writing them for you. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you feel like you're kind of like a baby drop into like not a, not a hostile environment, but in an environment that you never knew. And, uh, that you never will know because, I mean, I knew that I was set for a certain amount of time over there and that I was going to go back and figure out what was the next step. Uh, visas are usually pretty short over there, so mm. uh, it's six months and then... So that experience, uh, you described it as uh, sort of the biggest, most shocking one you had. What did that um, 
shock out of you or into you or what is the big change that happened for I felt it felt very eerie like being in the streets and, uh, and I felt like somewhat I was losing myself but finding myself at the same time mm. uh, because I think when you're in a, in, an, in a very new environment when when nothing is familiar you have to kind of find out where your limits are and what, what you can do and what you cannot do and how it is you interact with people and you kind of it's kind of like falling back into childhood and figuring out uh, how to grow up and live mm. again. There, yeah. there was a bit of that in that experience. Like, I spent a lot of time working in places that I didn't know. And of course, you can do that everywhere. But I think it took much more of a dimension in China, probably because I wasn't speaking the language. So you're making a really good job right now of uh, selling travel to people who <laughs> might be on the fence of their first trip or uh, moving to a new place. I mean, it is a beneficial thing to take yourself out of your known environment and throw yourself into a completely new place because, as you said, you feel lost, but you find yourself in a strange way. I think basically the best way to put it is do something that scares you. Yeah. Because then you figure out what it is that you can do, what it is that your limits are, what it is that what it is that makes you function or not function as a person. Yeah. And uh, it's good questions to ask yourself because then when you have to deal with daily situations and you, you're enriched with that experience, you have much more of a broader view and a, and a, more, subject, and a more objective perspective. Uh, and, to, and, and you have more insight, basically, when you make your decisions. Yeah, and it, it is a big experience to in a way, come out of yourself, not just as a person, but even come out of your society and, and be in a place that is so alien. Uh, the benefits of that are, are the ones we listed so far, but also you get to look back on where you were in a very different way from that point. You get to sort of see, um, uh, I described in a, another episode of my podcast, um, the experience I had with uh, an American in Montreal. I met this American in Montreal, and he was the first American I ever really spoke to directly. I never had met an American, and um, he, I saw that he was very black and white in his views. Uh, every issue that was any sort of debatable issue in any way, he would take an extreme stance on and sort of start fighting with me about it, right? trying to put me in a position, like, are you on my side or are you on the other side? And a lot of these places, I was sort of in the middle, I was sort of centrist on these issues, right? And he would get frustrated with me because he couldn't argue with me because I was not taking a side and he didn't understand that. And I didn't realize that's what was happening. I thought he was just sort of a, a hot, hot, uh, hot headed, hot headed. Yeah. And, and so I was patient. He would get mad and he'd run away and come back maybe a month later. I would think we would never speak again. And he would come back a month later. Hey buddy, how's it going? And we'd talk again. He'd get mad again at another issue, run away. And this happened for months and months. And then one day, finally, he came and we hung out. And in the middle of a conversation, he just really just randomly said, hey, I have to thank you for something. And I was like, thank me for what? And then he said, um, after every time that I would get mad and run away, I would think about what you said. And I couldn't help but think about it because I was mad. And then I realized that you weren't blue or red or black or white. You were somewhere in the middle. And in the US, we don't have that. We only have team versus team. There's no middle anywhere. And you showed me for the first time, basically in his life, that there is other options in the middle. And coming to Canada and meeting a Canadian changed his life that way. And that was crazy. I and mean, that's, what, that's why I love to travel as much. Yeah, that's because the kind of thing. Because every time you will encounter a new thing that you've never encountered before, and that will open up your perspectives. And maybe you will find out that somewhere Along those lines, there is something that is where you belong, and yeah. uh, at that moment in time, then you can figure out what the next steps in your life are. Right. So all this moving you've been doing throughout your life, you described it as a survival situation. Is it too personal to ask what the situation was? Is it too personal? Yeah, I think. Okay. Well, I think I could probably put it in a way that I said that I didn't have the best, uh, that I didn't have the best teenage years ever. Mm. Um, I've gone through a few phases that that uh, actually involved a near-death experience. Wow! 
Can you get into details on that? That sounds interesting. The, the, f the funny part is that, uh, well, I don't remember what actually happened within the situation. Like, I mean, obviously you disconnected from, from the reality, so you... you so sort wait, did you actually die at some point? So you had a mortal situation? Yeah. And you had a near-death experience in that yes. situation? Okay, go on. I totally disconnected from the events that were happening, actually. Well, I, I don't know how to put it, like wow. on Earth or something like that, like here. And I lost, I realized that I was still thinking, but I completely lost connectivity with, with the, the events that were unraveling. Right. And your physical self. You were just, an, uh, you were just a perspective out there. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and I just, I just, I just came back because I mean obviously I was being assisted by by firefighters and Wow, and, uh, holy moly. But but that was like the one time that I felt like okay I'm mortal. Yeah. And um uh, I remember talking about it with uh, with uh, with uh, some people that were involved in psychology and uh, that told me but you know uh, the moment uh, in life that uh, you s you stop believing that that you're invulnerable and that your life resides in like living a simple life, raising a family, is the moment that you realize you're gonna die because then all these things be become sort of meaningless, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think that's what's been inspiring me even more to actually get out there and explore all the possible, like really try and do something mm. with my life that I would be happy about. I was like, okay, I know what I don't want because I grew up in an environment where people were leading lives that involved, well, getting pregnant at 19, 20 years old uh, from your first boyfriend, obviously. Mm. And uh, not that I find that there is something wrong with that, but I just knew that it wasn't for me, that this wasn't what I wanted to have a life that was totally going on a track like that and I could never deviate from it, right? Mm. It's like first boyfriend, you get a kid, you know you're going to be together. And I mean, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but when you live in small towns like that and stuff, right. people don't really get a divorce. Uh, women are more vulnerable to the patriarchy and mm -hmm. those kinds of opinions get really pushed onto them and mm. and I was really I really strived to get away from it probably because of my mother somewhat I think she was the only one to always say well don't do the same mistakes that I did and I think she said it so much that I actually decided to go for completely the opposite Outside from the one time when I was 16 that we moved uh, for two years in Africa because my stepfather had a contract there. Or the first time she traveled was actually this year uh, to go to Los Angeles. So uh, she had never traveled she anywhere? She had never traveled anywhere. Right. Okay. Not, I think she has uh, probably seven brothers and sisters hmm. and uh, none of them travel. Right. None of them have a bachelor degree. Uh, none of them even finished high school, and uh, I'm just like the polar opposite of that. Uh, I had done two sheets of studies at the same time, I have traveled, I have experienced, and I'm, I'm craving for more. Right. And uh, I think the, the only thing for me that I'm really afraid of is that I will never stop. Mm. Uh, I think this is the only thing that I'm really afraid of that I will never be satisfied and I will always be striving for more to the point that I exhaust myself. Right, and then you become an old person, you don't have any roots, you become sick and no one can take care of you and then you're in trouble, right? That's <laughs> the thing you're talking about. I, I felt the same way. I mean, I think I share some of your spirit on that sense. Uh, I want to go out there too, just like you've done it way more than me. I've traveled one time and it was just a vacation, but I have this fire to do the same thing. So it's really inspiring to hear you uh, having done it, and definitely it would help to have a near-death experience because I'm aware of my death and I'm aware that I could die any day and I better get a move on this stuff, but I guess having the actual experience does give you a big kick in the butt, and I, I kind of envy that in a weird way. <laughs> it's kind of the point, you know, uh, people love that saying, that you reach the bottom of the pool so right. you can only push back up and you will go up really Faster, fast at right. once. 
But you have to reach the bottom of the pool. <laughs> mm, right, right, right. I think that was a bit of the deal. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. I, uh, I felt like I needed to get away from it. It was like that very moment. I was like, okay, so it's either I'm getting there again and this time I will probably succeed or I do something totally different. Hmm. And I think it was always that of my life. When I made a hard decision was when I was feeling so low that I actually felt like I I was reaching the ground and I could like push back up. So from this point where you started launching yourself out into the world, um, I suppose you started uh, using your artistic talents in a corporate sense to get around the world, right? Is this how it went? And then you ended up where we are today. Yeah. Uh, so you've been pretty much doing the corporate route through the world. But now it sounds like you're about to do something completely different again and sort of leave the safety of that, right? Did I read that right in our conversation? Yeah. Is that you're gonna try something completely different and way more risky? Yeah, I have, uh, I have worked enough in the field right now that, I've, that I'm thinking I can secure enough jobs that I could do it from anywhere as mm. a remote contractor. Right. And uh, I've been contemplating that option a lot because mm. I think that this is probably the best way for me to be able to personally figure out where I want to be with who I want to be because that's also part of the question. Right. And, uh, and wherever it is that I feel like being, I know I will be able to be. Because sometimes I think I, I will never be happy if I stay in the same place. Uh, meeting with the same people, doing the same routine. Hmm. So I think I have to get uh, into a position that will offer me more options. To, to keep moving, but take the security with you then. So you'll have sort of job security, but mobility at the same time. Is yeah, and, and I want to also get involved in projects that are not directly related to the field I've been working on. Right, projects that are better for your soul, I suppose. More fulfilling to a deeper... Craving. It's more that, you know, I feel like the way I started in the game industry was I had this strong belief that this could, gaming could change people's life. And we'll still hear about a few articles every now and then that says, okay, developer got a letter from a person that said, oh, your game changed my life. But I feel like it's only a few. Of, yeah. of, of us, of our industry that does that, that really convey a messaging that is deeper, that really brings something to people and that, that is not trying to sell them something, but bringing them something, bringing them an experience that is something that, that they can learn from. Right. So I got really frustrated because I started in the industry looking for that. And I moved for, I was in one company and I realized that it wasn't the way it works. Yes. And then I was in another company and I realized, oh, it's not working like that there either. Yeah, <laughs> imagine that. And then you get to your fourth or fifth company and in the meantime, you've done a transition into a totally different industry to try and see if something different was better. But you, real, you just realize that sometimes if you really want to bring something to the world, you have to actually put yourself out there and do yes. it yourself. Yes. So I started thinking about creating my own project and stuff like that. And, and I can use the people that I've met uh, as connections to actually involve them in doing different things, working maybe on smaller projects, but that have more basically of a goal that is to reach the audience. Uh, With meaningful messages. Not in a marketed way. Right. So what you were describing in a way um, was looking into the corporate environment for some meaningful accomplishment and realizing that it's a place devoid of that kind of thing. Would you agree? I wouldn't say it's completely void of it, but I would say that, well, probably because I had a lot of problems when I was younger, and, and I found some, some encouraging things in the medias, I thought, I want to bring some of that to people. So that's right. probably where my drive started from. And then uh, I've seen franchises that did that back in the days, go to hell. Yeah, right. 
And uh, I've seen the way we work, which is more of like, oh, okay, we need something that is enticing. Oh, let's give people guns and let's make them kill each other. And, right. And that's that's never been what I wanted to talk about. Right. Ever. And ever. Isn't, isn't that interesting now that I think about it, that this transformation you mentioned, uh, I agree, I got into the industry for the same reason, um, because back in the day, just like you, I saw some projects out there that were putting out really important messages that got you thinking in a way that was entertaining at the same time about some really deep issues. And um, now we're describing how, over time, this whole thing has sort of become corrupted into kill each other and shoot brown people in the head and war and guns and violence. And I find that very interesting because it seems like that mirrors human society. It seems like maybe in the beginning there were people that wanted to do beautiful things with human society and over the years it becomes corrupt and becomes about killing each other, not necessarily for us, but for the big power structures up top. Uh, those may have started very idealistically with ideas about bettering the human life and helping people around the world, but then eventually it just becomes about kill people and this is easier to do and you know, just this shallow sort of almost corruption that happens over time seems to have happened also in our industry. I mean, it's the thing that we read in, uh, that we have been reading in media for probably the past five years, right? It's like people telling you that the gap between the rich and the poor are like now like a big bridge that almost no one is ever able to cross. Yeah. And I think this creates an antagonism that 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 channels for more conflict. Mm. And uh, and there are games out there that that just surprise me in many 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 agreeable way, but. The fact is that I didn't happen to work on them. So uh, I think it's like the move of like the messaging has shifted more towards indie gaming. Yeah. And and somewhat it's it's a bit sad for me because I feel like I feel like really the people that have ways to spread the message are spreading the wrong one. Right. I right. think uh, that's like that's the best way for me to put it. It's like the people that have means to spread the message, the people that have radio communication that reach all over the world are just channeling the wrong things. It's true. And I guess it's also because somehow getting into a position where more and more people are going to hear your message seems to put a strange pressure on you to do the politically correct message. And it sort of makes you more afraid to do the risky thing. Um, whereas when you're virtually unheard, you could shout anything you want. And right? that's a bit tricky, because do you really think that saying that, okay, you are a guy and you have responsibility to take the decision to kill a bunch of people and not feel bad about it is the right message? It's is absolutely it? not, but it definitely seems to be the more convenient message for the way our societies are run Convenience, these days. yes. Politically <laughs> correct. Absolutely not. I'm sure many people would disagree. Right, and that's very easy to prove. I mean, let's make a video game where you're an Arab shooting white people in the head in America, going to American cities but I think that and happened, shooting white right? people in the I head. I think that happened, and this kind of thing that went viral over people saying that was tools for terrorists. and uh, Right, right, then it becomes a big scandal. It's a no-no. We shouldn't go that way. This is very bad. We have to stop this project. We have to ban it from America. I mean, you know what I mean? It, it's, it's so hypocritical, but you see the difference when you just reverse it. And this is what we're doing. We're saying, hey, shoot brown people in the head. Hey, it's okay. It's black people. It's okay. But it's Asian people. Just shoot them in the head. The only thing is that I'm seeing, I'm seeing uh, some developers right now rising and voicing concerns about that. I mean, I gotta give props up to Bioware for standing up for the LGBT community, for oh, example. Very good. Bioware. Hmm. Uh, the, I mean, they've been very good at like providing options that were not like narrowed down to, okay, we want to please the white alpha male uh, heterosexual, obviously. And they've taken steps towards uh, making gaming a world of, of acceptance for, for, for people to actually recognize themselves in it more. And they resonated with a deeper messaging, right? Mass Effect, you do what? You save the galaxy by what? By building relationships and friendships. It mm. shows, like, deeper connections on the human level also. Right. And, uh, and I feel like, yeah, there are, there are a few places that, that just push the envelope. But I just, wish, I just wish we'd grow up as an industry. And not only, like, few people here and there 
or or blank statements that are like, oh yeah, we're gonna revolutionize the way we narrate something, and then six months after you realize that the story is kind of like the same thing it was six months ago, and right. that there is, there is really no depth within whatever it is that you're telling people. Yeah, and I suppose the the thing you're sort of describing also is uh, like the difference between Star Wars and Star Trek, right? When it comes to series, Star Wars seems to be all about war and solving your conflicts through violence, but Star Trek is about diplomacy. It's about reasoning with each other as much as possible and only resorting to violence when there's no other option and it's a mortal danger situation. And that's why I personally always gravitated to Star Trek. I mean, I don't want to get too nerdy on you, but <laughs> for me, I've always respected Star Trek a lot because it seems to do that. It seems to make people think about um, very complex social situations with an analogy that makes it comfortable to digest because it's aliens on another planet and you don't realize um, they're talking to you about issues that are very close to Earth. Um, for example, I remember there was an episode where they go to a planet where there are no genders and there are some people on this planet who realize they have a gender, they're male or female, and they are very uh, secretive about it, they have to live in like underground societies, they have to hide their identity because they have a gender. And so, so it was like a comment on homosexuality, and it was a very well-crafted one because it's very tricky in this sort of reverse position that makes it kind of fun. It's, it's really funny that you say that. I think it was three days ago I was reading about a show that will be showing on BBC. It's a zombie apocalypse, so like the most tired genre at this minute in time when I'm speaking is right. probably the zombie uh, genre. Enough with the zombies but, already. But the interesting thing is that basically they, it's like you have this world and uh, there's been a zombie apocalypse, but there's a cure. Hmm. So they... It's all the cured people I see. that are ex-zombies are being hunted down and rejected by society. So basically, it's like a zombie apocalypse. Oh, so the ex-zombies are now a lower class. Yeah. Compared to the ones who never were zombies. Yeah. Right? And what about the zombies? The ones that stayed zombies, they're all dead? No, they don't stay zombie because there are so everyone treatment. was cured. It's okay. kind of like you can take a pill every morning when okay, you wake okay. up, and you still have so you still like an ex dead. So, so you're describing HIV, basically. Pretty much, yeah. Except that uh, they they took it as a social commentary, mm -hmm. and are they are talking a lot about the issue of like. Or oh, it is that you're perceived when basically you don't fit into the norm anymore and oh, mm -hmm. you cannot get back into society. And also some people that are being victimized just try to stay nice and keep the peace. Or oh, some others are trying to build armies to start wars. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's, it's mechanics like that that I wish we'd explore more. I mean, to a certain effect, to a certain, yeah, to a certain effect, mass effect does, but we're probably not doing that. <laughs> this is way too late to mention, but I guess I should mention that, yes, we are both in the game industry. I actually never mentioned this on my podcast, but a uh, surprise, I'm in the game industry. Um, so let me ask you this. Uh, you mentioned you've got certain messages you would like to put out through your work. Do you know exactly what those messages might be, the messages you're the most interested in spreading? But probably something that is not uh, kill each other. Of course. <laughs> uh, probably something that is more, uh, we should work to try and understand what it is that we don't understand. Yeah. Uh, try to work, try to walk into somebody else's shoes for a couple of days. I mean, games do that, right? Games sell you the fantasy of being somebody that you're not. And uh, it's not something that a lot of media do because, uh, I mean, even in movies, the level of interaction is, is a very summary thing. Basically, you just watch another character. Right. Whether you connect to that character might very well depend on, on a bunch of factors that, that are not controlled. Whereas right. in a game, you're like projected into these virtual characters and it's you now. It's not the character anymore right. to a certain extent. Right, that's a really good point. Video games are basically a simulator of being someone else, and what kind of people are we allowing people to be generally is killers and violent people. Why aren't we 
creating products. I know it sounds boring, but I know we could find an interesting way to do it where you become a peacemaker or you become a victimized person in a society that's against you and you find a way to overcome and you realize what it's like, sort of like the series you're talking about, but in an interactive, much more personal way. And there's true, there isn't a lot of that sort of complex situation going on in video games. It's I mean, mostly just you are attacked by these people, they're bad, attack them back. Basically, it's like even when I go see a movie, Uh, okay, sometimes I look for like uh, level zero entertainment, right? Uh, when I go and sit uh, in front of a uh, Tarantino movie, I don't expect to get uh, messaging out of it. Right. Sometimes I just want to enjoy something that is brainless <laughs> and violent, and it's fine. But what I'm saying is as an industry right now, we have a dominance of those products, uh, as opposed to a minority of products that actually use this as a tool to educate people. Right. To make them see that even if they are not traveling and getting themselves out there and be faced with different cultures and different way of thinking, and even if they are not engaging people that are different from them in conversations, they can get that from games. Right. And... and It's true, and, and there's a whole argument that could happen there. Uh, most people would say, well, if the only thing there is out there right now is violence and explosions, obviously it's because that's what people want to see, right? More people bought those games, so because of capitalism, they became the big thing. But I'm not sure. I feel like there's a certain laziness there. I feel there's a certain fear of risk-taking on the part of us, the creators, Uh, that we don't want to take the risk of doing something completely different that may not make money, but in the end may make a huge amount of money if it's done right. And I would, uh, I would somewhat point you towards uh, a, a talk that David Cage, uh, the head of Quantic Dream, uh, gave. David Cage? Yeah. Okay. Um, is the guy that made Heavy Rain. Okay, Although Heavy Rain, I yeah. don't find that the way he does it is particularly successful, uh, it's still very Hollywoodish. Hmm. It just came with the statistics that, in fact, I mean, when people look at the numbers, they look at the numbers of people who are playing games, right? Right. They look at whoever buys games at the moment. What about the rest of the population? The one that don't That's a buy good point. games. Right. Why yeah, don't they buy them? Exactly. There's a whole potential market out there that may not be buying games because they don't want to shoot people in the head. Well, and there is the, this is where some of the parts of the debate come in. I mean, I was working on a game before, Remember Me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's the Capcom game that's coming up. And uh, basically, uh, well, I haven't heard that myself, but uh, the creative director was saying, oh, lots of publishers turned us down because we have a female protagonist. What? Oh, my God. Yeah, that's, that, that's a lame one. I mean, this is a result of people holding on to power in high positions in industry that come from a completely different generation but, and need to be cleaned out, to be honest. But that, lifts, that lifts up the question, like, are we... We are making experience for people that we consider the majority of the people who, guy, who buy games, which mm. are white, male, heterosexual. Right. What about the girls that want to play games and play a girl? I mean, yeah. What about the homosexuals? What about the peaceful children? What about the elderly? What about the... Which is why Mass Effect was good with that, because it allowed you to be whoever you want to be. And maybe there's not a need to have that level of, that level of complexity to have options for everyone. But if developers started thinking about it as a model, like integrate more diversity in their characters, more... More people that are not like gaming trope stereotype, and then people could start and relate more uh, to games. Maybe hmm. I mean I know like for example I'm gonna talk a bit more as a girl as a gamer. I know that a lot of my female friends play only certain types of games, and which game are there? Well, they are the games that are more first story driven. And second, that allows them not to be a white stereotypical male that hmm. just with interacts muscles. with people in the way that is okay, a linear story, shooting people. Yeah. 
Basically I mean, simulating being a chimpanzee with a stick hitting people on the head. Obviously, <laughs> obviously they are, some are just attracted to the protagonists, so uh, that's the reason why they can play sometimes, but more often than not, they like to have a character that they can in some way relate to. Hmm. And I feel like this is what we're not succeeding at right now. I feel like I was seeing much more variety uh, back when I started playing probably around like 15, 16 years right, ago Right, back now. when the industry wasn't so restricted by high budgets and Hollywood production quality, back when it was more free, more decentralized, uh, like the indie scene of today, the independent game scene, uh, which is nice that we have that now, but it's becoming sort of a Hollywood situation where you've got big Hollywood movies that basically say nothing most of the time, and then these struggling, very meaningful, small, uh, independent projects that people in general seem to think must be horrible because it's not Hollywood. It sort of gives the indie scene. But I think there is look. much there is much more of, of a room in Hollywood, uh, paradoxically, for author movies. There are a lot of people that enjoy them, that that go watch them. There are a mm. lot of people that achieve critical success, success uh, no matter if they don't fit the norm. But I feel like in games, we're not trying. We're not even right. trying enough. Absolutely. We're definitely taking the easy path for the easy cash in. I mean, every project starts with what's hot right now. What other successful projects can we rip off and try to build off of, you know, instead of taking risks ourselves? And uh, I definitely, uh, I would say our particular company has taken risks, but not as much as it could with the power it has. So I would go back to the to the very beginning and be like, okay, the reason I started in gaming, uh, and uh, right now I'm confronted to what expectations versus reality. Right. My expectation my expectations were that we were there to tell stories. Uh, mm. We were there to tell stories to people to eventually teach them something about right. themselves or or about perception or or about or about illness or about about other people out there that are not living the same way that they are living. Mm -hmm. And uh, not everybody wants to be a soldier. Right, and I absolutely agree. I mean, I share this perspective exactly. This is why, as I said, I also got into the industry. But not only that, but when I was a kid, even kids' cartoons made you deal with more complex issues than today. It seems like everything has become dumber and less meaningful than when I was a child. I mean, my favorite series when I was a kid uh, was an anime called The Mysterious Cities of Gold. I don't know if you've ever watched this, uh, Les Cités d'Or, right? Yes. Great anime, old cartoon. And the thing is, people die in that series, first of all. That would never happen in Dora the Explorer, right? And this is a kid's show, and I wasn't traumatized by it. But I was re-watching this lately, and the thing that really shocked me was at the end of every episode, I don't know if you remember, there was a little sort of uh, documentary, a little educational two minutes at the end of each episode, which was uh, not animated. It was a video documentary about, I don't know, uh, another culture or history. And there was this one episode where they were talking about uh, Mayan sacrifice rituals on a kid's show. They were talking about Mayan, how they used to cut the hearts out of young women after drugging them. <laughs> and you would never hear this today. And the shocking thing was, during the video that would play while this narrator was telling you about this stuff, they were showing how today they don't sacrifice young women anymore, now they sacrifice chickens. And they're showing the preparation of a ritual where the shaman is going to kill a chicken. And I'm watching this and I'm thinking, of, of course they're not going to show him kill the chicken. But then suddenly they just cut the chicken's head off and you see it run around with like, just dying on a kid's show. I mean, this was... Regular, no one batted an eye back then. And today this would be a mortal situation for that project. It would be canceled instantly. It would never make it to television. right? But yet I'm not traumatized by this. I, I was shocked to see it today. I mean, in this day and age, because even in other media I've been protected from this kind of thing. But has it really protected me? It's just made me a more sheltered person, you know? I mean, it's the same situation. It seems as time has gone on, we've baby-proofed everything and nothing has any meaning anymore, nothing is challenging, nothing is um, edgy, everything is safe and, and nerf. I, I felt like, I feel like somewhat like we've, we've kind of lost an, an edge like that maybe we didn't really add before either, but I feel like the narrow-mindedness of, of certain persons that I sometimes 
come across just just strikes me and i'm like well what kind of tools do we have to help these people to get out there because i mean they would actually feel better about themselves if they if they didn't feel the, the need to antagonize over everything mm. if they did not didn't need the to feel like they need to actually start a conversation by keeping a stance and fighting the persons that right. would happen to have a different stance than theirs. The, everybody would, would actually live better if we could just show that antagonizing is not the only option. There is the option of trying to understand that right. we are different beings with different experiences. Absolutely, I agree on that. And uh, it might be a bit uh, idealistic, but uh, I believe that at least it's uh, something that's worth trying. I mean, uh, being in media gives you the power to get your message out to people, which is a power that you don't really have in any other media, except if you're talking about pure education. Uh, being a teacher, but then you only reach uh, a small amount of people right. and you're just hoping that those people will be willing to pass on the message and you work on a smaller scale. Right. But uh, but I do believe that we in the entertainment industry have the power to do something about that, to offer different experiences and to try and show that things are not always what they are, what people think they are. Right. And the ironic thing is the closer you get to the level of power within that structure to actually start telling the stories you want to tell, most of the time you realize you're handcuffed by investors, by higher-ups that run the show. I mean, it seems the process of moving up through such an, uh, an established and corporate industry like that seems to slowly strip away that, that energy that you have, right? And it seems like the closer you get to that decision point, the more afraid you are to do it. It's sort of like what I was saying earlier. It seems as people become more successful, they get shyer about what risks they take. Um, and then I guess there's a point where people like you and me, we get to a point where we realize I'm not going to accomplish this by moving up because the only way to move up is to give up this thing I'm carrying, this message I want to tell. And if I want this thing to be birthed, it's not going to happen here. And I don't you have to think. To I don't think on. that's necessarily the case. I mm -hmm. mean, some people have been considered considered visionaries in filmmaking and in, in, right. and in some other industries. And uh, I mean, to a certain level, some some game developers have, have been considered visionaries Definitely. as well. So some are willing to take the leap, and that actually becomes something that, that carries over through age. I mean, uh, basically what happens is that all those movies uh, have a status, raise a status from entertaining to cult. Well, that's when it carries a messaging or when it carries something, a universe, or something that people have, have not been confronted to before. Hmm. So... Audacity is always rewarded. That's the way I see it. But uh, you have to be willing to put yourself out right, there. Right, 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 right. And uh, I think uh, if I had to pick a, wo a word that I think is the most scary to people today in the world, I would pick the word change. Yeah, and I guess that brings it to what I think we've been talking about all this time, which is... Which is moving. Moving, and I think maybe also facing fear and facing discomfort, and even embracing it, it sounds like. It sounds like this is your perspective, that it's a good thing to embrace fear, uh, not embrace it as in hold it within you, but go after what your fear is and try to overcome it and um, not be afraid of it, not run away from it. Is this your perspective? Well, you can leave it within your own limits, but then right. you never... You're never leveling up as a right, person. Right, right. So growth uh, comes through facing fear, facing challenge, facing discomfort. Growth does not come from comfort, safety, and isolation. From no, I think reality. growth comes from actually expanding your your world of possibles. I mm. would say that's that's what I see growth come from. Mm. Whether it is because you're traveling, uh, because you're having a conversation with somebody that's about a topic that you never talk about in your entire life. I believe growth, uh, as an individual, for me, is about expanding my boundaries. Always. Absolutely. This, and that's the perfect description. You are literally expanding your boundaries and become a larger person as a result. You have a larger sight, you have a larger 
uh, range of motion, you actually do grow in this non-physical sense, which is very interesting. When you start doing it a lot, you realize that uh, the human spirit or the human mind really is some sort of flexible membrane almost that you have to push to grow, and it stays as far as you've pushed it. And you could just keep pushing it further and further. And I don't think anyone has ever found a limit on their own personal potential who has ever tried to keep going further and further. It seems like there's always something else to work on in this really cool sort of endless video game way. Uh, it's a video game you're leveling up in and you never ever run out of things to level up on. So it's always been strange to me, people that choose to not level up in anything in real life and just sort of loaf around because like this is the most amazing video game that we could ever design. I think, Yuga, you have to have a trigger. I was saying, for me, uh, what, what made me run away was the fact that I reached a rock bottom and mm. I hit it hard. And uh, and I feel like, uh, well, uh, you're never going to get everybody to do that. Because first, not everybody needs to do that. But you can probably use medias or stuff like that to 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 build certain triggers that can probably help people. Right. Sort of simulate the experience in a safer way, but still get their minds in a place that's uncomfortable for them in a very much safer and more controlled way that can bring more people to that experience of expansion. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah this, that is absolutely a very good use for any form of media, storytelling, movies, video games. There definitely is a huge potential there in our industry that has not been tapped for that sort of uh, very good result. Um, anyway, at this point, I've had too much beer. I need to go pee. So let's take a little break. Okay, so we're back. Um, where should we, should we pick this up? I think most people are going to kill me if I don't dig a little bit more on your near-death experience, uh, what it was like. I'm actually curious myself. Uh, it was weird because I felt like I was completely dissociated from my body for the first time. I felt like... Right, it was weird because you have a deeper connection to your body. I mean, you actually use it for what? For tons of things, for practical things, for things that are related to interacting with other people, for intimacy, for for tons of things. And when you realize that your reasoning and 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 the way you think can actually be disconnected from that, it's a really weird thing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a total loss of, of control. It's a total questioning of of the values you've lived with up until that moment, which were uh, I exist as a person, as an entity. Both my my mind and body are connected together, and it's this connection that basically represents the way I interact with my own life and with others. And uh, and it was really weird. It was uh, it was kind of like first, I thought I was never coming back. Wow. And uh, when I came back, I felt like something changed because I felt like I, I couldn't look at life the same way. Like, basically, up until the moment you face death, you feel like you're never gonna die, right? You're young, you don't have to question yourself about, about how you live on a daily basis, about what it is that you do, about what it is that you say or don't say to the people you love, about what it is that, that you do that makes a difference. And at that very moment, I was like, fuck, it can be gone any moment. Right, because uh, when you're young, you feel like your death is so far away. People only die when they're old. And I'm so far away from being old, I'm clearly not going to die anytime soon. And then all of a sudden, bang, there's death. And the, in a way, do you feel grateful that you had this traumatic experience? I mean, it, to me, it feels like a good thing. That I wouldn't trade my life for anything in the world. That but is a I good also, perspective. I also wouldn't wish it to anybody. Right, right. So there are the two ends of the spectrum. Like, there is what it gives you and there is what it takes away. Right. Uh, sometimes I've heard uh, saying people saying a lot that the more narrow-minded you are, the less you ask yourself questions, the more happy you can live. 
It's strange because sometimes, I mean, obviously we're both people that think way deeply into things and strive very hard to move out of our comfort zone, you more than me on that level. But obviously we're both people that are not, let's say, blissfully ignorant. Um, and sometimes I, I, I sort of wondered, would I prefer to not care? Would I prefer to be uh, just happy with whatever life hands me and just live a comfortable, easy, standard, cookie-cutter life and, and just not have many worries because I don't think too far? Um, the thing is, I don't think I would like that because in a strange way, even though I personally have had uh, also a lot of strife and trouble and discomfort and happiness and depression and frustration and anger over my whole life, in a strange way, the place I'm at uh, in the recent year is the happiest place I've ever been, and it feels like a happiness that is so deep and that is so primal and um, satisfying. It almost feels like I've been plugged in the energy of the universe in a strange way, and I don't think I would have gotten there by not thinking. It almost seems like that was the battleground to go through to get to the reward. And of course, we all know this, rewards don't really come without a price. You have to do the work to get the payoff. And I feel like the happiness, quote unquote, that people feel in an unquestioning life, in a comfortable life, in a standard sort of uh, blissfully ignorant sort of life, not to speak down on them. I mean, it's fine if you want to live that way, but I think the happiness you feel there is not really happiness. It's not really satisfaction. It's comfort. It's, it's almost like... Um, a pleasant stimulation. It's a positive feeling. It's a feeling of no worries. It's pleasant. But is it true happiness? Is it true satisfaction and joy? I'm not sure. I can't. I can only speak from my own perspective. Yeah. From my own perspective, the way, the place I'm at right now, even though it's still complicated, still a work in progress, I feel like I'm closer to a real kind of happiness and satisfaction with the life now than I would be if I hadn't moved my entire life. I think the only uh, I think the only the only point that I see is that there are different types of of happiness for different people. Right. We this don't have true. we don't all have the same goals. As I said, I'm looking for mine. Right. You seem to be still half looking for yours. Uh, also. Let's just say I know where it is, but I'm I'm currently tackling fear to get there. I'm in the place where I'm still worried about the walls of fear that I know are completely irrational, but I'm still fighting those, like facing off with them and like, ah, I'm up coming at you, but I know where I'm going and I just need to pass this phase. Which is which is why I'm wondering if that level of happiness that you have doesn't actually equivalent to the level of happiness that yeah. a person will have in a different situation. Yeah, I suppose you could different. never know. I guess, I guess probably if you are doing what you feel you need to do in your life, then that's probably where you need to be, I guess. But you have to really be honest with yourself and make sure that you're not doing it out of uh, laziness or a preference for comfort. I'm just trying to point out, I guess, that there is sort of a prize at the end of the trials of, of, of doing this sort of hard climb that both of us... My long, my long time questioning has always been, can you be happy when you work towards a goal that has been given to you, that you've not been choosing for yourself? Right. That's always been really my question. I think we're raised in social norms, and uh, and basically it's other people setting up goals for us. And uh, I mean, some of us decides that that's not what we want, so we go look for some other goals that we may or may not find in a short or long time period. But I was always wondering, does those goals we achieve over a really complex journey uh, bring the same level of happiness that hmm. those people have by achieving the goal that was given to them. I guess you still have a sense of fulfillment, right? Like you've reached a goal, so you must still have certain feelings that, even though they cannot be completely similar, might be somewhat related. Right, right. I suppose, I guess, then, the only sort of message that we could give as people that have traveled this sort of journey, would you agree that the best message we could give then is if you are a person who's always going for comfort and the simple sort of um, beaten path sort of route, um, 
Would you agree that a message we could give to a person like that is at least try to challenge yourself and see if you prefer that? Because I feel a lot of people might not realize that there is something better to gain unless they try, right? I mean, I've tried living the standard cookie cutter life to see if that's maybe a happier way to be, but I just realized that this is completely not in my character, and I'm absolutely miserable trying to accomplish that. Because once you have your, once you ask yourself a question, your mind wants to answer it. Right. If, if you, you don't have a curious ask mind. yourself a question, then well, you don't need to answer it. It's right. as simple as that. Right. So maybe if you didn't ask yourself the question, uh, would I be happier if I led another life? Yeah. You would have been happy being a cookie cutter. I will say this, I mean, I could absolutely see how someone who, say, lives in a small village, in a beautiful prairie, with, you know, all the food they want, all the social connections they want, in a very small, isolated place, I could absolutely see how you could live a beautiful life with real happiness in there, without expanding out of that place. I could see that, because there are still challenges you can face in that life, in that situation, right? And you can still grow, you can still learn, you can still have hard experiences that make you grow um, in that context. So necessarily people don't have to go travel around the world, but what I'm saying is, even in a small situation like that, I would suggest that a person shouldn't be afraid to try something that scares them, as you said earlier, or try something that challenges them instead of just sort of coast through life. I mean, it can be done through very basic things, like deciding to watch uh, entertainment that you don't usually watch. Right, challenge your mind with something new, something that... Uh, okay, or oh, I always go see comedies, oh, why don't I watch a, tra a thriller today and see what I get out of it? See, sorry, watch what? A thriller. Oh, a thriller, yeah. Yeah, or a tragedy. <laughs> or something, uh, yeah, something more complex. How about even watching foreign media? foreign films, foreign, or even not only foreign, but also from different eras in history. I find a lot of interesting things when you go back and watch old black and white films or, or just completely unrelated, just completely out of the blue stuff that you never would have looked at. Definitely there's enlightenment in all new experience. And I guess that's why I feel that the better way is to expand yourself and search for answers to questions because it seems to me that a life is a process of gathering enlightenment. I don't know if you agree with that, but it would seem almost a waste if you don't question anything and don't seek anything in your life. You have a whole life of having gathered not too much enlightenment. And I kind of feel like every soul is basically on this path if you go with the Hindu sort of model of reincarnation and growing every lifetime until eventually you reach completion for yourself. Uh, it's kind of a waste when you think about it that way to go through your life and not do as much as you possibly can to expand yourself. I, I kind of agree with that idea, especially with uh, the people that usually have children and and they don't really try and, and look further than what they can, than why they're bringing this child to the world. Okay, mm. we love each other, we're going to make a kid. And there's a biological impulse to and make a kid. And there is a biological impulse. And there's a payoff, there's but the then, joy. But then I ever wonder about what they're actually transmitting to that kid? I mean, I've grown up into an environment where nobody ever opened a book. Wow. Nobody ever. But not, they can read. They learn to read, but didn't use it. They learned to read. I mean, my grandparents couldn't read, but for reasons that were, they didn't speak the language and they were never educated. Mm. But it's not that they had the choice, right? right. Uh, so the were, skills they used was more survival skills. Yeah, they were migrating during war, and it was tough, and, and they learned French, uh, basic French, a very... A very... <laughs> A French on crutches, that's what I would call it. With <laughs> lots of words that didn't belong there, but nice. as long as you got the sentence and could understand the meaning, they were fine with it. Wow. And I don't blame them for that. But I noticed that then what happened is that, okay, they they made kids that grew up into an environment where they could ha they could gather no no further knowledge of, of cultural topics, have no have no very enlightening conversations with their parents. The the teaching was always very simple thing, right? Like you don't steal, you don't you be nice, you 
And me, I mean, if I ever have kids, I want to be able to open them up to a bunch of things. I want to have them traveling. I want to have them opening up books and being curious about things. I want. And this is also the reason why we, we do that process of like of enrichment. It's to be able to give something more to other people than just just being there and taking up resources yeah. and not offering much. And and not only that, but if you raise kids like that, you're not only helping your kids, you're helping society because they may become really astounding, very productive, very amazing people for having been so well challenged and so well sort of needed into this more ambitious person almost, this person that could accomplish bigger goals because they have tackled progressively bigger challenges throughout their life. And then they could do the big thing, like invent the next free energy or or change the political system or whatever. You know, it would take these big, giant goals on that a person who has never challenged themselves would never even be able to dream about. Uh, obviously, I mean, there is there is a there is a whole world to be to be said when you say that uh, be the change you want to see in the world. Absolutely, like, that's uh, a very good. Yeah, your 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 children are basically. The, are basically something you bring to the world and, and what do you want to bring to the world? What, what kind of person do you want to raise? Uh, that's always a question I ask myself, which is why I, I, I don't envision that I can have kids uh, within, within a couple more years or more. Mm. Because I feel like, well, I need to wait for the moment for me to, to feel right about it, to know... All it is that I can do well, and all it is that I can contribute to their life in a way that is really going to help them be better people. Hmm. Yeah. So let me ask you this question then, uh, even for myself or for anyone listening who may be in a similar situation. Um, the thought has crossed my mind to say go to India, like we mentioned. Uh, maybe I should just go off to India and live a little bit, see what kind of... Uh, great growth I can find there, or maybe I should go to South America and stay there for a while, maybe I should just throw myself across the world and just see what happens. But for me, that's a very big leap based on what I've done so far in my life. So what would you say to a person like me then, who's thinking about it and feels an impulse to do it, but uh, reason or maybe habit or, or, or comfort is keeping them from doing it? What would you say? There is a thing that I said me what kick started it is that I was in complete and utter danger. So mm. uh, the survival skills kind of like made me leap over the fear, right? Because the adrenaline was such that right. the fear couldn't come into play. It was like there was no other option. It was make take the leap or take the leap. Right. So the fear of staying put was bigger than the fear of jumping over. Yeah. Right. And mm. don't you feel like if you're looking for such enlightenment, the more you stay put, the more you lose on that? Yes. Island? And it's so frustrating because every single day that I come into this nine to five job and do this thing that puts my life energy towards teaching people to shoot brown people in the head, um, I, I kick myself because I realize I could pick up literally any day with the, the funds that I saved up and everything and I could just go. I could just go right now, tonight, if I wanted. But I don't. And I know that I probably would be happy having done it. But I don't. And it's the weirdest thing. It's, I guess it's because me, I have not jumped over such huge hurdles of fear in my life. So it's a very new thing for me. And I have no fear here pushing me except the fear of wasting my life and not accomplishing my potential. And that's... To be honest, it's a very amorphous fear. It's not a very present fear. No, I mean, right? I understand that it's not a fear that's pushing you in the back every morning when you wake up. It's more of a, like a, a lingering back yeah, of Yeah, it's, it's a sort of a little voice in your head that says, hey, you're supposed to be doing something. So what do you think a person could do to kick themselves in the butt? I mean, I'm trying to challenge myself in my everyday life, at least to face little fears, to get used to it, Give smaller us, fears. Are you, are, you some, are you somebody that's committed? When I make up my mind, yes. Then give yourself a deadline. Yeah, wouldn't that be something? 
It's just funny how fear tends to whisper to you in logic and tells you all these things that make a lot of sense, such as, uh, you know, what uh, about... I've always been telling myself that my brain was somewhat my own worst enemy. Yes, absolutely, and Because I <laughs> when I set myself up to do something, I always can find reasons not to. Absolutely. Uh, you always can find yourself an excuse not to do something. Always, right. no matter how small or how big it is. There's mm. always reasons that you can come up with that are like, this is why I'm not doing doing this and basically it's just you justifying it to yourself yeah it's would you accept if people were breaking a commitment that they make to you and giving up excuses mm, interesting so then uh, it's also you for yourself like do you want to re really be that person that's giving yourself excuses every morning for not doing something that you feel is good for you right it's kind of like a, the definition of totally being anti-selfish, like totally not thinking about what it is that's right because you come up with excuses not to. I think I, I think I need to make a commitment to, yeah, take on more and more of these uncomfortable situations until and eventually I... And I... I think this is where the, nif, the near-death experience come into play. So and I need to jump out of this window need, right now. You is don't what you're need saying. to. No, you don't need to have had it. <laughs> just, just tonight you are leaving this room. Think about it. A car runs you over. Yeah. No, I think what, about it all the time. Would, trust what me. What would you have done <laughs> for your life? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Whatever. Oh, no matter how big the pile that things you would regret would be, as long as you can get rid of one on the pile every day, you feel better about yourself. Yeah. I think that's the advice I would give. Then I guess I'm on the right path because that's what I'm working on. Slowly uh, taking things off that pile until I get to the bigger things and I'm ready to do that. Um, and yeah, I guess I'm going to have to pick up momentum. I've got actually a great three months coming up of no nine to five life. I'm going to have all the free time in the world and I'm going to be taking on these challenges, definitely. Uh, and it's very inspiring hearing your story and seeing your perspective. I definitely consider you a person who's more advanced in the risk-taking and fear-facing and, and growth-attacking category. So uh, I'm really glad you're able to sit down It took me chat. 10 years of thinking about it, so I guess uh, I have a bit more of a bandwidth than most people. But, but I would say that as long as you start thinking that way, you're like, okay, so I'm not, like, no matter, no matter how old I am, I will die. I can die tomorrow, anytime, today. Mm. I get, I don't know, like, whether it is you contract a disease, whether it is you find out you have cancer, whether it is you, you get hit by a car, your life can end any minute. And right. the question is, would you be happy with what you've done with it? Yeah, I definitely suggest everybody listening ask themselves that question. It's a very important thing to face. Most people try not to think about it, but you have to. I mean, you know what's funny is that I was reading that article. Uh, it's a nurse that does uh, that does take care of old people in in caring houses and stuff like that. And she was giving the top five of the biggest regrets that people express on their mm. on their deathbed. Wow. And. Uh, don't wait until it's too late to ask yourself that question, like, would I be happy with what I've done? Because people are expressing that they work too much and they neglected their families, which is something they could have woke up one morning and be like, if I died today, I wouldn't have spent any time with my family. Mm. So they could have answered, tackled that question a long time ago. Right. Like, I feel like it's all about saving yourself the regret of feeling like you wasted opportunities, really. The earlier you ask yourself that question, the earlier you manage to actually be a person that you be happy with and and you be like, okay, I can die anytime now. I'm fine. I know that I died and I was on the right track and I said what I needed to say and uh, and I've made whatever experience it is that I felt like I needed to make and uh, I'm I'm actually leaving no remorse behind. Hmm. And I think throughout this conversation, you've probably been a very great living example of how much a person could grow by undertaking those questions and challenges. Because I feel that you're a very deep person and I can see, I can almost feel your entire life through your perspectives. Uh, it's, you're definitely a well-traveled person. You're definitely a well-grown person. 
and I definitely appreciate you joining me. Uh, I guess at this point we should probably call it a day, huh? Yeah, I guess thank you for having me because oh, uh, anytime, your, your, your perspectives are also very welcome. I'll try to share it more next time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and yeah, I guess the, that's, that's probably all I had to say about the way I'm living my life. It's that I'm just trying to make it so uh, I save myself the pain that I know is upcoming. Save yourself the pain you know is upcoming if... Yeah. You don't do If something? I don't do something. Hmm, interesting. Well, you don't want to be coming close to it and be like, oh my God, there is that thing I haven't done. I will never forgive myself for it. It's like living on a good note, hmm. I would say. Very good. So, well, let's leave this on a good <laughs> note. And I know you're going to join us again. I hope you join us again before you go off on your next world adventure. It's been very great talking to you. Thank you for uh, spending the time. Till next time. Yeah, until next time. Well, that certainly hit the spot, didn't it? I hope it did for you as it did for me. The most amazing thing happened uh, after this recording. Uh, Alex and I decided to hang out a little more. We went to a cafe where we spoke for some hours, very deep and open conversations about our personal lives. And I found out that two weeks before I met her, she was to leave. She was planning to leave and have this new part of her life happen weeks before. But she hesitated. And because of that hesitation, along I came into her life to have this conversation and remind her of her values and her beliefs and what she's after in life. And as a result, I think she's reconsidered the direction that she's taking this whole thing. And she will still be leaving, I think, but maybe in a whole other direction. So we really affect each other's lives when we speak honestly and openly about deep topics this is, to me, more and more symbolic of why it's important to have conversation, why it's important not to hide truths and realities behind our masks and our, 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 our insecurities and fears. Magic really happens when you open your heart to other people and have meaningful interaction. So thank you, universe, for creating Alex and bringing her along to my life in just the right moment, because now I am on a three-month break. I had a very small window in which to meet her, and just before this break happens, I got to have this conversation too. What a huge coincidence, what an unlikely thing that we would ever meet each other and have this great, stimulating, inspiring, and thought-provoking conversation. But I'm getting more and more used to this stuff as I'm living life with this new perspective of looking for these openings when they happen. Magic just seems to happen. And I hope this podcast gets to your ears just at the right moment for you too. I hope this has meant something to you. I hope it's been inspiring, thought-provoking, enlightening. Maybe I encourage some people to live their lives a little louder than they would have. Um, that's one of the beautiful things about podcasts is that they sort of sneak into your life and, and affect you in a way that you really don't expect. And that's something I want to contribute to. I think it's becoming clearer and clearer to me that the message that I want to send is best sent through the people around me, meaningful contact with people, and the podcast, sharing things through the podcast. So here I have this great three-month break to work on the podcast full tilt I've got a big trip coming up in May that's going to be very life-changing. Uh, I'll talk about that later. And I've got this three months to decide what I'm going to do with my life. Do I go back to work or do I stop and try to focus more on this podcast, try to have a lifestyle that's giving me more time to do this and have a fairer distribution of energy between this and making money? Um, there's a lot of things to consider. There's a lot of things to do. And now I've got three months to consider and do. So until next time, keep thinking.